Well, as we come to the Word of God, we come to 2 John. Uh, We're going to look at this little letter in its entirety, all 13 verses this morning. And the title of the message is Precious Truth. Precious Truth. Can somebody tell me what PPE stands for? Very good. Personal Protective Equipment. I I figured there's a few people here that would be able to tell me that. I know some of your uh, work environments. (laughs) Many jobs, many vocations and responsibilities require some kind of PPE or personal protective equipment. Uh, Even when I worked at the grocery store, I was a nighttime closing manager, and so I was kind of cross-trained in the different departments. And some of the departments, especially the ones that worked with uh, raw food or had certain chemicals and cleaners that were needed for cleaning, they had PPE, certain personal protective equipment that was necessary to keep the employees safe while working in that environment. Now, some of you have worked in environments where the PPE was extensive. If you worked in the medical field um, or around dangerous equipment or chemicals, you made personal protective equipment kind of a permanent part of your daily routine. Whether it was face masks, sterile gloves, earplugs, eye protection, hard hats, these are simply designed to keep you safe. The reason we need to be kept safe though is because our human body fearfully and wonderfully made, living in a broken world, though, it's limited in its strength, right? And it's susceptible to injury, it's susceptible to disease, it's susceptible even to mortality or death. And so if we value our health, if we value our our safety, we will take those proper precautions to protect ourselves from the dangers of the work environment. We also live in a world where there are many spiritual dangers as well. We live in a world whose God is the devil, a world that is filled with sin, that's filled with temptations and false teachers. And they're all seeking to lead us away from the true God. They're seeking to deceive us, to weaken our faith, to lead us away from God and into sin. So we need spiritual protection. We need spiritual PPE, if you will. We need to guard ourselves from the onslaught of the evil one and the false teachings of the world we live in. Just think about the dangers if we don't. First, if you have worked in an environment where hearing protection is required, or maybe should have been required, (laughs) you know the risk involved if you're not wearing the earplugs, right? What if you're even supplied with earplugs, but you put them in your pocket? Do they do you any good? No. The truth is, you might be okay the first day or two or maybe the first week or two or even month or two, but over the course of time, without wearing that protection in your ears, you might have noticed that your hearing becomes less and less, right? It's a slow and gradual process usually because the the correct protection was not taken. Well, if we don't take the correct spiritual precautions, over time, we can become susceptible to the lies of the world and its wicked ways. You know, so God has given us spiritual protection against the lies of the world. We have the responsibility to use it and to utilize them um, and to use them correctly. We have to put the earplugs, if you will, in the ears in order for them to work. But God has given us some protection against the spiritual um, onslaught of the wicked world. Now, in Ephesians 6, that's where we find the primary passage, if you will, upon that spiritual armor or that spiritual protection. And if you remember, the first in that list is the belt of truth. Well, as we come to 2 John, this idea of truth is John's focal point for our protection against the deceptive attacks of this world. We're simply going to be encouraged to guard ourselves with truth this morning. Guard yourself with truth, the truth that God supplies. Well, as we look at this little letter, we'll break it down into four parts concerning truth. And as we look at truth from these different parts, we're going to be encouraged to guard ourselves with truth. We're going to see that truth is a gift. We'll also see then that truth produces godliness. We'll also see that it produces discernment. And then finally, that it produces joy. So let's look at it as a gift as we open this letter. 
So verse 1 through verse 3, and pay attention to the word truth as I read these opening verses. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father, Son, in truth and love. John makes it fairly clear what his point is going to be, or at least one of his focal points of this little letter, and that is truth. Now, we ended our extensive time in 1 John last week, and now we come to this second letter of John, and, and it's sometimes called a postcard letter along with 3 John because of their length, but this was written, as, by, or written by the Apostle John, and he identifies himself as elder, and it really was just simply a title that displayed maturity, uh, even a, an endeared position of leadership. And so like a beloved mentor writing to friends that he is seeking to encourage, he writes this letter um, as he is probably at this point still in Ephesus. This would have been prior to John's exile to Patmos. And so he's writing from Ephesus. We don't know the exact uh, recipient of this letter or their location, but we do see that it does have a recipient, and that is the elect lady and her children. That's all we know right? That's all we know. There's been some speculation as to who that might be or who that might be referencing to. Uh, There's really two possibilities. First, it was a godly lady that was a part of one of the churches in the area of Asia Minor, most likely, perhaps even a prominent woman uh, who used her home to show hospitality to traveling teachers. That seems to be uh, what uh, potentially was the, the recipient here. Uh, he calls her the elect or chosen by God. Her faith was evident. He could with confidence say to this particular woman, I, I see your faith. It's evident in the Lord. And so she, along with her children, are the recipients of this personal instruction. Perhaps even if we look down to verse 13, getting ahead of ourselves, but he closes with this conclusion, the children of your elect sister greet you. Perhaps if this is the case, then John says, I know your niece or nephew or your nieces and nephew. I know the children of your sister. Maybe they were in Ephesus, were sending greeting. Again, we don't know the specifics. That's one real possibility. There's a second possibility, and that is the elect lady was a title that he used for the local church, one of the churches that he was writing to there in Asia Minor, as the bride of Christ, and her children being the members of that church. And so there, the children of the elect sister, down in verse 13, would be members of the church from which John wrote there in Ephesus. Peter actually used kind of the same type of designation in 1 Peter 5 when he's sending greeting. It says, she who is, it, who is at Babylon... And he's referring to the church of Rome there in, in Babylon as, as the church at Babylon. It says, who is likewise chosen sends you greetings. So the truth is, we don't know if it was a specific lady or if it was the church. In either case, he was writing to give information that would have been handed down to the church and has been handed down to us today. It's a pertinent message that you and I need today. Now, for sake of reference, I'm going to refer to the recipients most often as a church. Part of that, it helps me make the application to us as a church here today and individually as well. But knowing that there's a real possibility there may have been a specific lady that he was writing this letter to as well. So John says, I, along with my fellow believers here, I love you. So I love either this elect lady, as I mentioned, or this church, these people to whom he wrote. And he gives the reason why in verse 2, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Here's the truth. Truth unites the hearts and love of God's people. Through the gospel, through the gospel truth, you and I have been united to Christ. And we've been united to each other. There's a special union that we share in, right? We, we, sp- we share in a special bond as God's people. We, we share in the same life. We share in the same family. We love the same Savior because we're all in the truth. 
And it even mentions this truth abides in us. It, it has taken up residency in us. We have become the home, if you will, of truth. Now, this wasn't our own doing. It wasn't as though we were going out and saying, hey, I want to be the home of what is true. <laughs> Instead, it's a gift of God, the God of truth. He goes on to say, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. From who? From God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. So you and I, we've been placed into the truth and this truth is a gift from God and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it has come along with God's grace, his mercy, and his peace. So what does it mean to be in the truth or have the truth abiding in us or receiving this gift of truth? Does it simply mean that we know all the facts there is in the world today? Well, no, that's not what he's talking about, right? He's not talking about the, the fact that we know, you know, all the scientific um, uh, knowledge there is to know. What he's talking about is spiritual truth. He, he's talking about knowing God. He's talking about having salvation in Christ. That to have the truth in us is to be transformed and converted and saved by God through Christ. This is the truth, right? This is truth that we are sinners. The truth is you and I, without Christ, we're sinners. We were facing holy judgment under the judgment of God's wrath for all eternity. That was a just payment for our sin. But we also know the truth that God is rich in mercy and grace and, and he has loved us. And Jesus, is only, his, God sent Jesus, his only son, to take our place, right? The God-man, he took our sin and our judgment on the cross, and he died in our place. And he rose from the dead, paying our sin debt in full, so that through faith in him, we could have eternal life and eternal forgiveness, eternal righteousness. This is knowing the truth, right? Think about it. There are a lot of lies in this world today and the big lie that Satan has sent out into the world in many different forms is that you do not need God or you need a different God or you can find your way to God. You do not need the God of the Bible. You do not need Jesus Christ, right? That is what un the unbelieving world believes. But he says, you have come to know the truth. The reality is you might have an unsaved family member or neighbor and they might deny the existence of God. They might deny their need for a savior. They may deny that there is eternal life to come and that there is a hell and a heaven and what we do here directly impacts, what we believe here directly impacts our future. But the truth remains, doesn't it? Just because they might believe something different doesn't change the truth. And the truth is, we all need Jesus. And so for us who have faith in Christ, you as believers, you have received this gift of truth. And it has come by God's grace, right? We didn't deserve this. We didn't earn this. But in his love, he has given it to us. We have, re we have received his mercy. He's the one who looked upon us with pity and compassion. And, he, and through salvation, has given us peace. Right? We're reconciled back to God, restored that relationship. See, we live in a world that denies the truth of our sinful condition and our need for a Savior. In fact, this has always been the case. We can look back to 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, and we read about the world in this way. In their case, he's talking about the world that denies their need for a Savior. He says the God of this world, that would be Satan, has blinded their eyes, right? Or blinded their minds. He's blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. That's where we were without Christ. Our eyes were blinded to the truth. What are some of Satan's lies? Well, many of the lies do revolve around God. There's the lie that there is no God. That's a prevalent one today. There's a lie that there is a God, but he's unknowable. There is a lie that God is simply unfaithful. You can't trust him. There is a lie that says God's not holy. It really doesn't matter how you live your life because... God has no bearing on your life. There's a lie that God is in all of us, all right? That God just is 
kind of in and through all of us, and that's who God is, just this mystical force. There is a lie that God appears as, as any type of deity in any religion. You can know God through any means. All paths lead to God. There is a lie that we do not need to be forgiven for our sins. There's a lie that says that if you do a lot of good, you're going to have a good future. There's a lie that says that Jesus, you know what? He was just a good man. He's not the Savior. There was a lie that says that Jesus is not necessary for eternal life. There's lies about ourselves as well. There are lies in this world that says simply that you are here by chance. There's no purpose and meaning really in life. You're just the product of evolution, right? That's one of the world's lies. There is a lie that says you can determine your own truth. Whatever you believe, that's good enough. There is the lie that says you deserve to be comfortable. That's the whole purpose of life is your comfort or your success. There's a lie that simply says you're basically good. All right? You're basically good. Everybody's basically good. When, in fact, we read in Scripture that we're all sinners and rebellious against God. And there are, there, there's the lies that says that we can choose our own morality. There's a lie that says that you're a victim of your circumstance. There's a lie that says you must pursue happiness as your greatest end. The truth is, there's many more. We could fill out that list with a whole bunch of lies, right? We live in a world that's filled with lies, deceptions that blind hearts and minds. No wonder there are so many opposed to God, right? This is why there's so many in rebellion to Jesus. There's, there's why so many cast aside the truth of the Bible. It's because they have accepted or believed a lie of the evil one. But you know what you have come to know as one of God's people? You've come to know and receive the truth. And here is the truth about truth. Whether we believe it or not, it remains steadfast, right? The truth about God, the truth about his son is true. Whether the majority accepts it or not, the reality is you and I, because we believe in the God of the Bible and our faith is in Jesus alone for salvation, in this world we are in the minority. But just because the majority has, has rejected this truth doesn't believe it's not true, or doesn't mean it's not true. In fact, truth remains. It's a silly illustration, but you know what? You can believe all you want that running red lights is safe, right? Just try that for a while, okay? But the truth remains it's very risky, and the truth also remains that there's a consequence to being in a car accident, Right? Just because we believe something doesn't make it true. That's why truth is a gift from God. We we have to have some sort of steadfast foundation for even the truth that we believe. We come to the word of God, the, the word of truth, and this is a gift that God has given us. He's opened our eyes to the truth. His spirit has opened our eyes to the truth so that we would know him. To know God is to know truth. He is truth. He's the source of truth. So to know God and to know truth, that's a gift. But then it also is given to us for our protection. So let's look at some of the things that truth produces. And it first produces godliness, verses four through six. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. John says, you know what? I am greatly encouraged. Why? Because you're walking in the truth. He says, your faith is evident. He says, I see evidence of truth in you. I see evidence of your faith. I see evidence that you know God. And so this brought him great joy. For those of you who have children, you know the joy or the pain of seeing them either following the Lord or walking away from the Lord, right? John looks at this, at these people and he says, you know what? 
it brings me great joy because I see that you're walking with the Lord. There's no greater joy than to see somebody that you have spent time and invested in, whether it's your child or a friend, or in this case, these were people that he probably ministered to or he knew of through the church ministry and saying, hey, I see that you're walking with the Lord. Now he says, some of your children, this doesn't mean, it would be too much to read in the fact that that means some were not. Um, it's just simply, he, he may have only been aware of some of them. So he just mentions here the joy that he has over their faith. They were walking in truth as commanded by God. Now, we have seen this in 1 John. This is God's command to his children that we walk in truth. We, we no longer are living a life that is accepting the lies of this world. But to walk in truth, it's a gift But just like the earplugs, we have to kind of do something with them, right? We can't just leave them in our pockets. So when he talks about walking in truth, he's talking about ordering our life, ordering our way, aligning our life with the truth of God's word. To live in truth is to have our path or our way of, of living molded by God's character and his will, right? Because to know God is to know truth, and then we act accordingly. We walk according to who God is. It informs our way of life. It informs our, our actions and reactions. It informs our emotions and our conduct, and even our priorities are ordered by truth. And here's what that produces. When we order our lives by truth, it produces love and obedience. He says, here's... It's not a new command, right? This is something you already know. Love God, love one another, and keep God's commandments. But this is how it works. If you know God and you order your life by the character of God, you know what it's going to produce? It's going to produce love. And it is going to produce obedience to his commands, which can all be summarized by the two greatest commands, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's go back to that illustration of the stoplight. You know the truth, right? So if you run the stoplight, there's a high risk of accident, and you know that an accident has a high risk of injury or even mortality. So the truth about that, it governs how you drive. You stop when the light is red, right? Why? Because you know the danger. Truth has informed your driving habits. And so you stop. Well, when you know the truth about God, when you have accepted his way by faith, that truth then governs your conduct. You walk in love and obedience. So let's just talk practically for a moment. When you sin, you have accepted some form of lie. All right? Now, sometimes we are deceived, and other times we accept that with our eyes wide open, kind of wholeheartedly. So, when you get angry at the person who cut you off in traffic, or the co worker who didn't finish the task for a second day in a row, or the child who willfully defies your instruction again, And in unrighteous anger, you yell in response, you get heated, you seek to make that person's life uncomfortable or miserable, uh, or you retaliate in kind. What lie did you believe? Think about it. Perhaps there's a number that could be true. Perhaps it was the lie that says your time is more important than that other person's time, right? I mean... Yes, people are selfish, but so are we. When somebody cuts us off in traffic, we're selfish because that's our spot, right? And our life is more important than theirs. And you know what they're thinking? My life is more important than theirs, right? But we believe that lie. It's one of the lies that perhaps we have accepted in that moment. Uh, Perhaps it's the lie that says your comfort is of greatest priority for your day. You know what? Somebody inconvenienced me. They didn't get their part of the work done yet right? That's inconvenient. I deserve a more comfortable life than this. I deserve to be served. Or perhaps it's a lie that simply says, God's not just. You know what? Somebody's got to bring payment to that person's sin. May as well be me, right? 
No, we, we, we can believe certain lies about who God is that leads us to sin. Uh, another example, what about when we covet? What about when we look around and we desire those things that we don't have lustfully? We want what we cannot have or, do, or are not supposed to have at that moment. Well, we can believe the lie that we deserve better things, right? We, we can say, you know what? I deserve more than I have. We can believe the lie that our entertainment or our pleasure is the key to our satisfaction. Like, I'm not going to be happy until I have that. Or we believe the lie that simply God is not good and he has not given us enough good things, right? Now, we might not verbally say, yes, I accept those lies, but in action, when we sin, we are accepting some form of lie of the evil one. So I would encourage you to do this. Some of those sins that you might be struggling with, some of those sins that, you know, easily tempt you, ask yourself, what are the lies that I'm believing? What are the lies that I'm believing about God? What are the lies I'm believing about others? What are the lies that I'm believing about myself, right? James even talked about our speech, and he said, you know, with one, with one breath, we, we, we praise God with our words, and then the next we curse those who are made in the image of God, right? Sometimes we just don't see the value in other people. We believe that lie. So fundamentally, our sin begins with a lie that we believe about God. But on the other hand, when we believe God, and this is where truth begins to protect us, when we believe God, when we know God, when we know the truth about God, when we're walking in that truth, then when someone cuts us off, or when someone's incompetent at work, or someone disobeys our instruction at home, we walk in truth, and that looks like loving them, right? And that looks like godliness, we believe that God is just, so we're patient with others. We believe that God made others in his image, so we love them with kindness. We believe that God works in all circumstances to conform us into the image of Christ, and so we turn even an offense into an opportunity to love God and love others. Or when we are tempted to covet, whether it's the success of, success of others or the influence that others have or, or things that we don't have or, or relationships that people have that we don't have, we instead believe God, right? Rather than coveting, we believe God. We believe that God has given us a purposeful path in life. And that might include less than what others have. We thank the Lord for the blessings that he's given us and we find our satisfaction and hope in him rather than the idols of this world. See, this is how truth protects us from those lies. It produces a godliness in, godliness in us that protects us from sin and the lies of this world. So just as earplugs do no good, if they're still in our pocket, we have to take the truth that we know about God and then apply it to our lives, align our life with it, allow it to produce godliness in us. But it also, third, truth produces discernment. Verses 7 through 11. And here's why John actually spent the opening of this short letter talking about truth and then godliness. There was a reason that he was writing. And he, we come to one of the main reasons here why he's writing. And that is there were people in the hearing of his audience that were trying to deceive. All right? There were false teachers. So he says in verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. So we have seen from 1 John that there were false teachers. Some of them had even left sound doctrine, had claimed to be a part of the church for a time. They went out, proved they were never of God, and they were now preaching a false gospel, saying, you can know God, without Jesus, right? You do not need to believe in Jesus. In fact, they were denying that Jesus had come in the flesh. They were denying that he was the Christ, the anointed one of God, that he was the savior of the world. And so they were preaching a false gospel. And since they were teaching this false gospel, they were striving to deceive. As it says here in verse 7, they were deceivers. And they were also Antichrists are opposed to Jesus. They had rejected Jesus as the only way to the Father, as the only way to forgiveness and eternal life. But that's the truth that all other spiritual truths hang on, doesn't it? What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? 
No man comes to the Father except through me. Now, either that was a true statement or it was a bold-faced lie, right? If it's a lie, then we're also calling God the Father a liar because God said of Jesus in Luke 9.35, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. So then we look and say, wait, the, tr- the truth is this. The spiritual truth we need is Jesus. He's the only way for life and reconciliation to God. Now we have come to know this because God the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to the truth through his word. Jesus said in John 17, 17, your word is truth. We have the Bible here today. It is truthful. It contains truth because it contains information about God and a revelation of God to us today. Truth hasn't changed. Over 2,000 years since we have this little letter given to us, the truth has not changed. The world would like to say truth is antiquated, right? We, 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 that's old. That's, that's, you know, we don't need it anymore. We got to find something new. We got to find new enlightenment. That was the problem with the false teachers of the day in John's day as well. Look down at verse 9. He says, everyone who goes on ahead... The idea is to run ahead, to, to, to go before something, but doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ. So these are teachers that were going outside the bounds of Christ's teaching. That one does not have God. Whoever abides, though, in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So here's a warning against, the, uh, against believing a teaching that goes outside those bounds of truth from Jesus, the teachings of Jesus and the teaching about Jesus that we find in the word of God. We live in a city even, we live in a nation, we live in a world where people confess knowing God, but they believe that they must change whether it's Christianity or the truth that's found in the Bible to fit what is new, right? Or new ideologies, whether that is those who denounce the inerrancy of Scripture or those who embrace a different form of gender identity or those who are looking for a new revelation from God and casting off what we have in God's Word. These things are happening even in the city we live in today. The truth is we live in a world that is seeking something new and is unwilling to believe the truth that has been revealed, that has been revealed. So, since that's the environment that you and I are going to enter into as we leave here today, what must we do? Verse 8, he says, watch yourself, right? Watch yourself, or keep your eyes open is the idea. It takes some maturity to watch where you're going, right? When you were a child, that was probably something either your mother or father told you often, watch where you're going. You know, watch so you don't step in something. Watch so you don't trip over something. Watch so you don't enter into danger. I know what that's like. You know, you watch little kids and they're looking other ways and slamming into things, right? Watch where you're going. Keep your eyes open. That's what he says here. Don't be the fool. Be observant of your surroundings. Solomon actually gives us a great illustration of the fool who is unaware of the temptation that surrounds them, specifically the temptation of adultery. Proverbs 7 He says this, I've seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youth, a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner. He's talking about the adulteress, you know, taking the road to her house. And in the twilight, in the evening, when it's dark, at the time of night and darkness, he says, you know what? There is someone who is a fool and simply doesn't even realize that temptation is out there. And they're headed right towards it. So here we have this warning in verse 8. What do we need to do? We watch. We guard ourselves. We're aware. We don't play the part of the fool. And how do we stay alert? How do we stay aware? Well, it is by knowing God again and his truth. Once we know his truth, it opens our eyes to be watchful, to guard ourselves against the deceptions. One, we know that there are temptations and lies out there, but it also provides the protection against that. He says, watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward to lose or, or, or to fail to obtain or even to bring to ruin what was worked for. 
Now John may be referring to the rewards that God gives his faithful people. We cannot earn salvation, we understand that. Uh, and, and yet God in his, his mercy and grace for his faithful children, he rewards us generously for the faithfulness that he works in and through our lives. But we also see that if we don't live faithfully, we can forfeit some of those rewards when we get to heaven. That doesn't mean we lose our salvation. In fact, we're still going to have a wonderful future. I like how, for those of you who knew Pastor Pat, he always said, it's not going to be like we're going to go around and be like, oh man, they got more than me. He said, it's going to be more like Christmas morning where all the kids are going like, what'd you get? What'd you get? You know? And I think that's a good illustration of that moment. But there's a faithfulness we're called to. So he says, you know, don't, don't lose what we have worked for, but you might win a full reward. But I think better is to look at it this way. John and the apostles, even what we're working towards today, is simply that we're, they were working to present the church blameless before Christ, right? They were working towards seeing the lost evangelized, come to know the Lord, added to the church, walking in holiness. And if these believers who John had labored over and others had labored over, if they turned aside from the truth, they would prove, as we saw from 1 John chapter 2, that they were never of the faith. And in this sense, they were not part of God's family and they would not receive the reward of faith or that reward of faith, which is eternal life. And so he says, be careful, watch yourself, all right? There, there is a sense in which we have to be careful so we do not lose either the reward of faithfulness or even forfeit or ruin some of the work that we've already strived to do in the lives of individuals as well or even in the life of the church. So here is a great promise, though, from God. We who believe the truth and walk in the truth, we're going to receive a reward. There is a reward for walking in the truth. Even if that is not rewarded in this life, it will be rewarded in the life to come. The war against sin, the earnest service for God, it's going to be worth it when we enter our eternal reward. So how do we live faithfully? How do we guard ourselves even to obtain that reward? of faithfulness or the the reward that is eternal life, to enjoy that. Well, it is first to know God, right? If you don't know God, you will not have eternal life. But then we guard ourselves with discernment, the discernment that truth produces. Again, when we know truth, we begin to be able to recognize what is false. So if someone comes with a different gospel or teaches a way that doesn't align with the teachings of the Bible, the teachings of Christ, we know that it's false. We know that it's deceptive and we know it's dangerous. We can go the other way. He gives this discernment a practical outworking. Verse 10, he says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, that's the truth about Jesus, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Now, a little bit of context is helpful here. Because in those days, there weren't pleasant hotels for travelers to stay in. There wasn't a lot of available accommodations for travelers. So strangers, sojourners, they were often unprotected in a foreign community. They would need to find somebody who is hospitable to stay with. This was especially true for those who are traveling teachers for the church. And, and they would seek hospitality in the home of a believer. Uh, or even in the home that the church might meet in. A lot of the early churches met in homes. And here, specifically, if this was a, a, a woman to which John was writing, this elect lady was an individual, perhaps she had opened her home to uh, teachers before, shown great hospi- hospitality to these traveling teachers. And this was a good and godly display of love for others, but perhaps she had not been discerning. Perhaps she hadn't evaluated their teaching, and unwittingly she had allowed false teachers to use her place kind of as a base to uh, you know, spread their false teaching from. If this is more in the context of the local church, Perhaps they had allowed some false teachers in to share a new doctrine, a new teaching, and that denied Jesus Christ. And so he says here, don't receive them into your house. Don't even give them any greeting. Now, he's not talking about a simple hello. He wasn't saying you can't be friendly. That's not the point here. The greeting here has more the idea of giving them a blessing, all right? Really a well wish for them perhaps even endorsing their teaching, saying, hey, you know, here's a good teacher. (laughs) You know, follow them. So to receive a false teacher into the home was really to aid them on their way 
to offer them a post from which they could distribute their false teaching and, and even to endorse their message here with, with a blessing. So again, th- this verse sometimes is taken and used erroneously into our context today. This doesn't mean that we can't welcome someone into our home, even someone who believes something different than us, in order to love them and encourage them towards the Lord. That's not what he's saying. But it does prohibit supporting, encouraging, or aiding the ministry of someone who is teaching a false gospel. All right? So we have to be careful that we're not actually supporting, aiding, or, or endorsing someone with a false gospel. We can bring that more into the practical context in which we live because we invite teachers into our home almost every day, don't we? Through the TV, through podcasts, through YouTube, and, and, and the like. The truth is false teachers have a direct access into your home, into your phone, to your TV, to your computer, whatever it might be. And the caution is here, be careful who you welcome into your home. Be careful who you listen to. Be discerning so that you don't give place in your home and into your heart to someone who's teaching the lies of this world, even in the name of Christianity, right? Don't give them a platform. Don't share their messages on Facebook. Don't give them a place in your heart, right? Don't, don't listen to their content. And on the church level, we must be very careful as well, and we are, to, to allow even those who teach and preach here uh, that they're speaking the true gospel, we evaluate even the teachers and preachers that we have through from time to time and making sure that they're going to teach what is true and accurate according to the word of God. So here's how we guard ourselves then against the lies of the false teachers. It's through truth. It's by knowing what is right, by knowing God, knowing his ways, knowing the truth about Jesus. Then we can evaluate correctly what is right and wrong. If it doesn't line up with Christ, We reject it. We stay away from it. We don't welcome it into our homes, into our hearts. Now, the lies of the world are subtle, right? We must be aware of that. They often take, most often take truth, and they mix error with it. So we must be guarded, again, by the truth of God's word. We can't evaluate something based upon our own opinions. We can't evaluate based upon our own feelings or even our own desires. They're going to steer us wrong. It must be on the truth that God supplies. It protects us. It protects us. It is, as Ephesians 6 says, that belt of truth, and it works together with the other armor of God, which is righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word of God, prayer, and all this together protects us against the schemes of the devil. But we need truth. So truth produces godliness. It produces discernment. But it also brings joy. We experience joy or produces joy. Verses 12 and 13, as this letter concludes, he says, though I have much to write to you, I'd rather not use paper and ink. He simply says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to wait to share more. Instead, I hope to come to you to talk face to face, really personally, to, to look you in the eye, right? And hear your words and we can have a conversation. And he says, for this reason, so that our joy may be complete. If you look back at verse 4, John had already great joy because he knew that they're walking in the truth. And now his joy would even be complete, or come to completion when he could sh- see them walking in truth personally and he could share truth with them as well. See, the lies of this world are only going to leave us unsatisfied. They're going to leave us empty. They're going to leave us disappointed. But walking in truth, knowing God, knowing his ways, walking in his ways, that's what brings true joy and satisfaction, and fulfillment. Not only to our lives, but then to the life of our fellow believers, to us together. He says, the children of your elect sister greet you. He says, the fellow believers here, man, they, they, they're rejoicing because you're walking in the truth as well. It fills me personally with great joy when I can look at your life and I see that you're walking in the truth. When there is evidence in your life that you love God, that you're serving him, that you're ordering your life and even guarding yourself against the evil one by the truth of God's word, that brings me great joy. That we exist together as a church to encourage one another toward the truth. So when you guard your heart with truth, you encourage others to do the same. And we share in that joy together. So take time to guard yourself with truth, to know your God, 
to align your ways with Christ, to, to guard your heart with some doctrine, to enjoy the fellowship of God's people. Guard yourself with truth. When you leave here today, you're going to enter a world of lies. But truth is one of the spiritual protective pieces of equipment that God has given us. So make sure you use it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your truth. Your word is true. Lord, truth begins by knowing you. We know you, the true one. Then Lord, as we come to know you, in a deeper and greater way. Our lives are aligned to your truth. Help us, Father, walk in a way that is in step with you, that is uh, measured by and aligned to your word. Lord, may it be so that we would guard ourselves from the lies of this world. There are so many, Lord. There, there are some today that, that we're believing or may even believing wholeheartedly or in part Lord, give us that discernment that we would see even those, the errors of our way, the errors of our thoughts, that we would believe what you have placed in your word. Lord, I thank you that we can know you. I thank you that you've given us this gift of truth. May we use it for your honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen.